I thank you if we could uh, call a house to order and make a start. Um, my name is Richard McGregor. I'm the Washington Bureau Chief for the Financial Times. Uh, we've got a very distinguished panel here today, um, starting with Dr. Rebecca Blank, who's the Acting Commerce Secretary, uh, Sri Muliani Indrawati, who is the, uh, man the Managing Director of the World Bank, and um, we don't quite have a Chinese-style nomenclatura system in the US, but I'm going to accord uh, Richard Atkinson ministerial rank as well uh, for the purposes of this panel. And he, of course, is uh, CEO of the biggest, um, world's biggest uh, publicly listed copper company, uh, Freeport McMorran. Um, so we're going to start, I think, with just some overview from each of the panelists, then a bit of interaction between them. And the last 20 minutes will be given over to questions um, from the audience. Now, I wanted to start with Dr. Blank. Um, uh, very briefly, an introduction. She's been Acting Secretary of the Commerce Department since June 2012, which, of course, makes her an important member of uh, Mr. Obama's cabinet, overlooking economic policies, export promotion, job creation, and the like. Uh, she's been at Commerce since 2009, uh, and prior to that had a distinguished uh, record in academia and at the Brookings Institution, and in between times was also a member of President Clinton's uh, Council of Economic Advisers. Um, and she'll also be returning to academia at, from the end of this month to the University of, at the University, to be Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison. Uh, I wanted to start Dr. Blank, I mean, you're off next week, a trade mission to Brazil, Colombia, and Panama. Uh, um, um, give us your overview, your sense, uh, both, I guess, of Latin American economies, but in particular, the US ties with Latin American economies, which have grown rapidly in recent years. I mean, has the US been able to take advantage of that, uh, of that to leverage that? I mean, have, have economic ties um, go on to another new level along with the development uh, of Latin America? Well, thank you, Richard, and I'm delighted to be at this event and have a chance to interact with everyone here. Um, so the uh, United States connections with the rest of this hemisphere, and particularly with Latin America, have been growing very rapidly in terms of the economics of this. Um, our trade with the Western Hemisphere has jumped more than 50 percent since 2009, and you know, we have every reason to believe that that growth is going to continue. You know, a country like Brazil is now the second largest economy in the hemisphere. Um, we obviously have long-term, very strong trade and economic relations with Mexico and with Canada, our two closest neighbors, um, and are expanding those relations with, with you know, other countries a little bit further south. Twelve of the 20 U.S. free trade agreements in force are currently in this hemisphere, including the um, two that we signed with Colombia and Panama that have come into effect over the past year. And one of the reasons I'm actually going down this next week for a trade mission in which we are going to visit both um, Brazil, Colombia, and Panama is to celebrate the first anniversary of the implementation of those, those free trade agreements in Colombia and Panama. Of course, what's driving the growth um, of you know, our economic connections and our trade in this region more than anything else is the uh, growth of the middle class. Um, inside Latin America, and particularly, again, in countries like Brazil. Um, a World Bank study a few months ago noted that the middle class in Latin America and the Caribbean grew by 50 percent between 2003 and 2009, and it's that type of large growth that I think is, um, uh, you know, is, is likely to continue to, to grow trade. Now, having said that, there's some challenges um, in these relationships. Many people in the room are more familiar with some of the diplomatic challenges than I am. Let me talk about some of the economic challenges. Um, you know, one is that there still are in a number of countries some rather substantial um, barriers in terms of trade, and um, even in some countries a movement towards greater protectionism, which, um, you know, clearly, you know, doesn't help the integration of the U.S. economy and other economies in the hemisphere. One of the things that we are trying to do, in addition to, um, you know, sort of the ongoing advocacy and work that happens at Commerce and at State to open up these relationships, is that Commerce, we're really trying to set up a four-way dialogue dialogue, not just between the two governments, but also to include in that dialogue the private sector in both the U.S. and in Latin American countries. So, for instance, the um, CEO Forum, which is set up between Brazil and the United States, has been very successful in raising a set of issues and talking about them in a way that
that I think breaks out of the bilateral U.S.-Brazil government conversation and actually gets other parties who have some real on-the-ground experience and interest into the conversation. And I think that, that CO Forum has been quite influential um, in some of the things that Brazil has done recently, for instance, in signing an aviation agreement with the United States. Um, you know, they've really pushed us in terms of opening up our visa process, and we've done some rather major changes, not just in Brazil, but in another of countries. So, so you know, that's, that's important. We also have to work on the customs and border management issues here. And um, as you know, there are a number of places where simply getting goods in and out of the ports takes far too long, and there's way too much red tape. Um, and that not only limits growth inside the country, it limits growth of the exports back and forth with our country and with other countries. And, um, you know, working on that front, I think, is quite important. Let me just say a word about my, my trade mission, and then I'll stop. Um, so we're taking 20 countries down, uh, 20 companies down to these countries with a focus on infrastructure. And um, if you look at what's happening um, in particularly the three countries we're going to, um, there's huge infrastructure investments going on. Um, Brazil has its growth acceleration program, which is pl a plan to invest $800 billion in the near future in all forms of infrastructure, from rail to port to roads um, to airports. Um, they, as many of you know, are going to be having the World Cup there in 2014 and the Olympics there in 2016. So the urge to get these infrastructure investments done and done quickly is, is quite strong. Colombia is making a, you know, a much smaller country, is making a $25 billion investment over the next four years in ports, airport modernization, and roads. And Panama, which is in the midst of a major canal expansion project, is also linking that with a variety of other infrastructure improvements. So we are bringing companies down with a particular emphasis on U.S. companies that provide services, engineering services, design services, environmental services, um, you know, the you know, the, the sort of expertise, quite honestly, that the U.S. has a great deal of and that is sometimes lacking in country, um, in some of this, particularly some parts of Latin America. And I'm really hoping that um, with these huge infrastructure investments, that this trade mission together with other work that's happening, you know, will really help find some ways for business back and forth between the U.S. and Latin America to only expand and, and to form some very good partnerships. So, you know, that's the sort of things we're working on, and I'll look forward to coming back to some of that in questions and answers. Um, uh, thanks, Dr. Blank. We'll come back to some of those topics. Um, mm -hmm. Just a brief uh, introduction to our second panelist. Uh, Sri Mulyani Indrawati is, the, as I said, the Managing Director of the World Bank, a PhD from the University of Illinois. Uh, was also a visiting professor at uh, Andrew Young School of Public Policy in Georgia State University. No traces of a southern accent, though, I think. <laughs> um, of course, she joined the bank in... Uh, 2010 after blazing a trail as finance minister in Indonesia and steering the country through uh, this very important transition to uh, a democratic government, anti-corruption campaigns and also the uh, global financial crisis. Um, uh, she's also overseen recently the report um, about uh, the emerging middle class, uh, so-called in Latin America, something mentioned by Dr. Blank as well. I mean, is that genuine? Um, is there a genuine middle class? Is there genuine mobility? And if you can, because of your experience in Asia, you might give us also a comparative sense of how uh, Latin America is developing compared to Asian economies and both, I guess, in terms of growth and governance. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Well, I think uh, the report says about this uh, growing middle class, the question whether this is genuine, it's, we have to look maybe in the past 10 years of how Latin America and Caribbean actually achieve their growth as well as development goals. First, the environment, the global environment in which they operate, uh, whether this is coming from United States, Europe, or uh, Asia, especially China, they provide uh, the source of growth which is coming from the external side, that you can see it from both the export as well as from the commodity and natural resource. As of course, you know that Latin America is really depend on commodity-based uh, and natural resource-based uh, economy. And that's explained uh, at least a good performance in the last decade. But that's not the only explanation. I think the policy, the domestic policy of many uh, Latin America, if you look at Brazil, Mexico, the biggest uh, uh, Latin America, they really provide with uh, the growth model that can be enjoyed more by the bottom 40%. And that's exactly what you mentioned about not only reducing poverty to the 13.3% if you use 25 
uh, dollar per capita, but also uh, moving out 73 million out of poverty and putting this 50 million new middle class, which is, I think, explained quite a lot that then the domestic source of growth is becoming available for this economy to maintain. This is going to be very important, especially if you talk about not only the past 10 years, but what is going to be the next for the Latin America, because they can no longer only depend on the external factors as, as a source of growth, but they have to look more on their own domestic side. And this is exactly the challenge. While they are very successful, for example, uh, uh, developing the, 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 the program that provide more for the bottom 20 or bottom 40, whether this is uh, uh, Oportunidades in, in Mexico or Pulse of Emilia, but this is only creating what you call it the safety net that will prevent the poor to going back to the poverty, going down from the, uh, to the poverty line. If they want to move forward, and you ask about comparison with Asia, it, this is very interesting. Coming from Asia, of course, I, I always constantly ask our chief economists, why in Latin America, they are growing around 3.5%. This is the prediction for this year, while for Asia is 7.8. For Asia in general, especially when I was finance minister, if I look at the growth rate below 5%, I think this is too low. I, I, I see 3.5 is actually very low. And here, when I see all the literature and, and, and the report on, on Latin America, when they say that, well, they are growing close to 5%, of course, exception for a certain country like Panama, uh, which is, I think, growing very fast. But in general, the big country, they are talking about 3.54% is the average. The economy actually growing at around 5%, and then if you go beyond that, it creates overheating. So it can easily, there are a lot of constraints. We can see it whether this is on the connectivity, logistic, and infrastructure. And I think pushing from the productivity side, that is then you are talking about the labor scale and education. Education is the big challenge there. If whether you talk it not only, not, not in terms of access, but more on the quality because you can see it whether this is on a score uh, of the average student that uh, comparing to the Asia. So now you're asking about how to compare with Asia and how they are going for, for Latin America to grow further uh, beyond what is already achieved, especially quite impressively in the past decade. For them to really invest more on a scale, to, so productivity is the, the name of the game. But this is going to be also the question, are they going to follow the ASEAN model or they are going to have their own? given that they are natural resource and commodity based, but the connectivity among the Latin America is actually less integrated. They are connected more with the outsider, whether to United States, Europe, or even to China. But among themselves, if you talk about the regional integration, lack is actually the less integrated if you compare with ASEAN 10 or even East Asia uh, uh, trading, uh, as well as the investment uh, uh, policy. So this is going to be one of the source of growth in which they can look at the connectivity among themselves that then create the source of growth. That will require, I think I'm glad to hear, and this is exactly the area, whether this is connectivity which is going to be facilitated with a one custom union. In ASEAN, you have one single window for, for doing that. That will make it much easier. Infrastructure, road, as well as port, which is I think is going to be very important. And then you also have to improve uh, on the quality of the scale that makes services, because it is not the manufacturing base, but services, which is, I think, is very important for the Latin America and Caribbean to boost productivity. I think this is the area which I think a challenge. The World Bank certainly work with uh, all the client country in this region and try to uh, match this challenge with a program that will actually uh, uh, really based on the improvement of the, 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 uh, the, the, the productivity as well as their connectivity with the, with the global world. Now, in, in the future, because of this growing middle class that you mentioned uh, earlier, it is real, yes, it's real. It is also supported by the labor participation, because especially on the female, women uh, labor participants explain significantly in, in reducing the poverty, but that's also as one of the source of growth which is actually you can rely. So there are a lot of source of growth within the Latin America, which is I think with the right policy, with a more effective institutional capacity and state 
especially at the local level. A lot of especially big country like Brazil, Mexico, they really rely on a local government, provincial state and local government to actually provide the basic services for the poor and that create what you call it, sustain the progress that they've already achieved. So the effective state is gonna be there. But I think one which is very particular for Latin America is also the, the, the fact about the crime and violence because this is the area which is always holding them back and that's which is not being seen in, in ASEAN country. That create additional cost for them to actually move forward. Thanks very much. We'll come back to some of those issues. Uh, Richard Atkinson, as, our mem as I mentioned, uh, Seaport, uh, sorry, CEO of Freeport, uh, also has, I think, a unique um, uh, bird's eye view of uh, managing risk uh, throughout the globe with operations in Peru, Chile, of course, a massive mine in Indonesia, and also the Democratic Republic of, uh, uh, of Congo. And copper, of course, is also, you perhaps might explain to us, is a good bellwether of uh, global urbanization, housing demand, particularly in China. Um, uh, which, of course, is, you know, in turn a bellwether might be for the middle class. Um, um, he's got a CV which I think is too long to read out here, um, <clears throat> uh, based, of course, in Phoenix, Arizona these days. I mean, g give us your view, uh, particularly, I guess, to start with about uh, copper, which has been quite volatile lately, right. um, and, and how, uh, you know, you've got a... A, a view of mining and dealing with governments around the world, and how is Latin America uh, different? I've got the designated southern accent here today, too, by the way. So uh, great to be here, and compliments to the Council of Americas for putting this, this event on. And Ibu Shri, uh, what well, I'll talk about copper really ties in to exactly what you were saying. Uh, we supply about half the copper here in the United States. Uh, we follow only Cadelco, the state-owned company in Chile, in terms of uh, producing copper around the world, and, and we're gaining on them. Um, uh, copper is a commodity that really has uh, interesting economic dynamics. Historically, in developed economies, copper is the commodity that's most closely related to industrial production. So when business cycles would improve, copper demand would improve and fall when business cycles would weaken. Um, over the past, say, 15 years, but particularly in the last 10 years, a whole new element of demand has emerged for copper with the development of, of, of infrastructure and globalization and, and, and urbanization in China. Uh, China, which in the 90s consumed less than 5 percent of the world's copper, today consumes almost 40 percent of the world's copper. And following China will be other large population centers around the world as they develop. India today, with its huge population, is only less than 5% of the world's copper. But in Asia, uh, Latin America, Eastern Europe, as uh, development occurs, copper is going to be required. Uh, it's too expensive now for some of the historical uses for, for uh, gutters and for uh, plumbing, and, but, but in today's world where Everything is being increasingly mechanized, and in things like uh, hybrid cars, electric cars, any kind of energy saving investments uh, requires a lot of copper. So the demand long term for copper is, is very bright. The thing that happened with the emergence of China in 2003, so for the past 10 years, that differs historically from copper is that we now have a much different supply situation. Historically, whenever copper prices would go up, there were known deposits around the world, mostly in Chile, but other places too, US, Canada, Australia, and they were known, industry would invest in it, new supplies would come about. Geo geologically, those supplies now are very limited. And the quality of new copper mines that are available is much lower than his history. In history, grades are lower. They're often underground. They often require huge infrastructure developments, and so you have a commodity that, with a good long-term demand outlook, and supply challenges, and that's what's driven the copper price so high. Uh, it's what our company is based on. We have enormous resources. We have over 200 billion pounds of 
reserve and resources around the world to develop. And, and it, it, it's, it, it's really going to be an interesting situation now. In Chile, for example, uh, which is the world's largest producer, a couple of years from now, Peru will be the second largest producer. We have three mines in Chile and a, a large mine in near Arequipa in Peru. Uh, the, the fact that the, the old high-grade, economically positive copper mines have already been reviewed is going to be challenging in the future. For example, we have enormous resources in the United States, in Arizona, where we have, uh, we have five mines, two in New Mexico, that 10 years ago were thought to be worthless. They were viewed as end of life, you know, the Southwest Copper Distri District was viewed to be dead. In today's world, with the challenges of quality internationally, with the fact now that we've got this new energy situation in the U.S., that we have productive labor and so forth, the development of these mines is going to be challenging for Chile as we go forward. So uh, mining is obviously very important to, to Latin America. I think uh, it, it, it provides, uh, it and oil and gas provide over 50 percent of the exports for all the countries except Mexico. It's, uh, you know, 60 percent plus in Chile and Peru where we operate. And mining requires huge investments, very large employment. We have 25,000 workers in Papua, in one of the most remote places in the world. It affects the environment. It expect, affects communities. It affects political situations. And that makes the business a tough business to operate. Worker safety is a big challenge. But it's tremendously exciting. It's obviously, as you said, both of you said, driven the economies of, of Latin America and, 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 and the countries that have managed it well or doing well, they've got great opportunities for the future. But those opportunities aren't going to be so as easy looking forward as they have been over the past 10 years. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to some of the issues in that. I just wanted to first raise an issue that um, Dr. Blank raised, which was about uh, protectionism. Um, uh, we just had a very spirited contest between Mexico and Brazil to head the WTO, resolved in Brazil's favour yesterday. Um, uh, and I don't know whether we can tie that to an issue raised by Sri Mulyani, which was about the relative lack of in intra-regional trade in Latin America compared to, to ASEAN. But Dr. Blank, first of all, if you would like to talk about that issue of protectionism that you raised and, and um, what are your concerns? Um, uh, 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 in that area. So um, I guess a couple of concerns. Um, one is that, uh, you know, I'm, you know I, I think there's reasonably good evidence, and I, you know, I'm an economist, so it's not going to surprise me when I say this, that protectionism in the long run does not usually help a country. Um, that many countries will say we have to put various barriers on to protect small industries, domestic industries, help them grow. But, you know, if you look historically at how things evolve that, you know, almost never do those, you know, as those industries grow, do those, does those protectionist um, measures come off? I mean, it's, 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 it's a difficult, um, difficult political area. And, I, you know, anyone in the United States or elsewhere understands the, you know, the, the urge, the political urge for trade protectionism, that happens pretty much everywhere. But the problem with it is that um, it really does limit growth in a variety of ways. Um, the way a lot of industries grow is by partnering and, you know, competing with, um, you, know, in, you know, basically um, other firms in the industry that might be a little bit further along that basically forces them to develop the productivity of their workers, to develop the um, processes, the cutting edge of their innovation and their research. And um, if, you know, a company that's not exposed to that type of competition, which is increasingly international competition these days, um, often doesn't develop into a world competitor. Um, so you end up with a domestic industry that isn't internationally competitive, in part because you've put the protective measures on top. So, you know, in terms of long-term economic growth of countries, I guess I'm a pretty strong believer that the more open your borders, um, the more that you're going to actually build industries that are, you know, have global export markets that compete around the world. And um, the protectionist measures, you know, always look attractive in, in many short-run political conversations, but they end up coming back and biting you. But are there any particular yeah. examples that uh, you, you, you want to point to? 
Um, well, you know, we've had conversations and have ongoing conversations, for instance, with Brazil. And Brazil um, has put various tariffs, very high tariffs, on a whole variety of products that it has, all, all within its WTO um, uh, abilities. You know, they, they, I'm not charging any violation of WTO there. But, um, you know, it's, it's been a challenge. And, you know, not only does it, um, you know, do these seem to be quite arbitrary, but they go on and off. And it makes it very difficult for, you know, companies from outside that want to compete in Brazil and bring goods into the region um, to quite be sure um, what the economic situation is going to look like three and five years out. And if you want to come and make a major investment in Brazil as a U.S. company and don't know whether there's going to be a tariff put upon your product, you know, in the next three years, that just, that, that, that makes you much more cautious about it, that investment. So that these things, and, and you can see in a number of areas, and Brazil's, I'm, I'm using Brazil only as an example, you can see this in some other countries as well, where investments simply haven't come in, and that in turn limits the economic growth potential for the country. Thanks. Sri Muliani, on the issue of intra-regional uh, yeah. trade, um, what, what do you think is holding that back compared to ASEAN? Is it protectionism? Is it habit? Is it complementarity of the economies? Well, all of them, I guess, uh, Richard. In this case, <clears throat> I mean, uh, the, the design of their economic growth or their growth model, which is mainly based on the natural resource and commodity base, will make them not really uh, becoming complementary to each other. And second, I think the design of the policy, which is not really reliant on the external uh, demand uh, driven in Asia is really that they know that this is export. And the chains of the supply chains, that is the in FDI, especially on the manufacturing sector now, treated that you are not going to put one factory in one country to produce the whole uh, product that then you rely only on one location. You usually depend on many different parts of the world as well as to produce different parts of the products and then you assemble into one product. And that's create a totally different risk feature. For, and, and this is make and force the ASEAN to become more and more integrated, whether you're talking about the trade policy, investment policy in a way, because they are becoming dependent to each other. You talk about electronic product or automotive product in this case. The lack, because they are more on a commodity base, they usually send it to the, to the final demand. I think if you are going to look at the growth model, the Australia and Canada is going to be what the growth model they, in which they can uh, look at some, uh, a model of uh, moving up to the ladder from the current position. But even if you look at, the, uh, you come from Australia, so you know your country well in this case, but Australia or Canada, they are very open. So their policy on trade and investment is very open. For, for lack, because they also have one of the characteristics which I see as a very different from the ASEAN is that the saving ratio is lower. And that's why uh, every time they, they need to create growth, they really depend on the other saving, saving from the rest of the world, meaning from the FDI. And that is totally different uh, uh, than in terms, uh, it will force them to create a much better policy environment within their own region. So, Policy matters in this case, if they are going to change and moving more on a diversifying from the commodity and natural base, I think the choice is whether you are moving to the manufacturing or sectoral uh, or services sectors, uh, then you talk about whether each of the uh, member country in lack is going to be complementary to each other and that then you are going to integrate that will require a lot of investment on infrastructure, connectivity. I think even if you talk about the mining, but even if you talk about uh, the, the manufacturing product, that will require a lot of investment to facilitate the move of the people, but also the product. And uh, I think the institutional capacity of really moving to that direction will also depend on their uh, thinking or vision about whether this is going to be one pack of, of uh, economic power as a group, as a group rather than individually. And that, that, that definitely really depends on the, the mo most important player. In ASEAN, of course, the role of Japan, South Korea, and China in this case is really become the locomotive that will integrate even more on this region. Here in LAC, then you have Mexico, you have Brazil, 
you may have the Colombia now as the pl player, and that can become the locomotive of integration uh, across uh, the, the, the country, uh, the member country. So policy matters, institutional matter, infrastructure matters that will facilitate this integrated integration even more. But I think it should not only limit uh, among themselves. Their uh, dependence or uh, uh, relationship, trade relationship as well as FDI with the United States is definitely there, is very big. You can use the NAFTA as actually to become the locomotive for the rest of the, the, the region, as well as uh, in this case with the rest of the world, on China in this case. Um, uh, thank you. This is going much faster than I thought, and we have a, a bit under 20 minutes left now for questions. So we sh I should open the uh, – we haven't even got to talk about China and Latin America yet, but I should open. And please identify yourselves uh, and uh, respectfully keep the questions short. Uh, Robert Shreda, International Investor. We've, for a long time, been proponents of more trade with Latin America on one basic premise. Near sourcing is far better for our economy here in the United States than far sourcing. With some of the international perspectives we have on the panel, I wonder if you could reflect on issues, whether it be the extension of a supply chain or subcontracting or exchanging personnel, the advantages of near sourcing versus far sourcing. Who wants to take that? Rich? Okay, let's see if I can if I can talk about it. We we certainly, you know, operating all over the world have issues of how do you get the right people in place. Uh, we employ local workforce and one of the things that that is key uh, in my experience to being successful in operating as a global com company in countries is to find the right local managers to take leadership positions to help you work with that and, 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 and obviously you're going to have local workers. So um, we, we work with uh, our suppliers, uh, truck manufacturers to uh, test equipment that works right in the right places. Um, but I guess when I think about your question, I'm not sure if we have to go where the resources are. We can't just say we want to do business in Chile because it's got a real acceptable view of, of, of the mining industry. There's a lot of competition for resources in Chile. We end up in Papua. Uh, we end up in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we've made the largest private investment in the history of that country. And it's a country that's a very challenging place to operate. Uh, it's really gratifying our business to see what mining can do for communities and people and health and education and so forth. And that's certainly true in the DRC. But it's a big risk to go there. And uh, so uh, we kind of have to go where the resources are and then decide how do you staff it up, how do you supply it, how do you manage political risk? You know, you were asking me about that earlier, Richard. And I guess in thinking about it, the one thing I learned is you can't think you're so smart that you know how to do it. When you go into a country, you have to learn. You have to listen to the situation in the country. And it changes. I mean, your country, it's a lot different than operating under the Suharto administration than a democratic uh, uh, with provincial authority in Indonesia today. Uh, Freeport, which is known for taking risky investments in challenging places and managing them well, 25 years ago declined to participate in what became the world's largest copper mine, Escondida in Chile, because of political risk in Chile 25 years ago. And now think of what our company takes on to operate. And by the way, you know, Political risk in the United States is no cupcake. So, uh, 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 so anyway, I, I don't know if I can really address the, your question directly because of the nature of our business, of us have, having to go where resources are and then finding ways to operate wherever they are. Okay, you both want to I would, li I would like to add, because on that question, I mean, the necessary condition in lack is actually now is, is really there. I mean, if you compare the, the two decades ago, 
On the macroeconomic policy, they are adopting more or less the prudential macro policy. I mean, if you compare even now with many of the high income countries, I think they are more on a very prudent side, of course, on a debt to GDP ratio, the, the, the independency of the central bank. So their path of those both macro or monetary, fiscal, or even an exchange rate policy. So they have the necessary condition. The scale or the education with this growing middle class, they are becoming more and more aware about the importance of education and scale. So you have that one. Still, the bottleneck is actually on the institutional quality and the infrastructure. So yes, I think the near sourcing is going to be there. When the obstacles and the cost of doing business is becoming lower, you can capitalize even more. Far sourcing, in this case, either then create more uncertainty, not from the geographical distance, but I think you are referring to many other factors. But Richard mentioned, Richard here is mentioned about even here in the United States, you have also a different risk. But if it is going to be on a cultural distance, whether this is in terms of the familiarity of the local politics, the way they do things. Labor policy is actually very important. And many of them, I think, with all the good social safety net, of course, there is always a consequence about what you call it the minimum labor cost and protection. And that will, if it is on a manufacturing business, it's definitely is going to be matters a lot. But if it is on the mining, I think that is maybe less relevant, although that is going to be more on a certainty about the, 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 the regulation itself on creating what is the right compensation so they are not going to be random and ad hoc. I think that's Freeport uh, experience in Indonesia. So in a way, I must say that near sourcing can be capitalized because the necessary condition, as well as many of the achievement in the past decade is already there. The potential is becoming very, very big now. Uh, just, uh, you know, as others have said, the um, the presumption for near sourcing is that it's cheaper, you know, that you, you can, you know, that you, and um, that assumes all else is equal, and often quality and access to um, certain skills and productivity aren't. But even the assumption that, you know, the closer is cheaper, you know, really does depend upon, um, you know, how easy it is to get goods in and out of a country. If, it, you know, the ports are really badly backed up or if the customs don't work very well, and, you know, if it takes you five days to get out of one port and one day to get out of another port, you know, you can go actually quite a distance away and end up with a cheaper transportation cost. And the same problem is internal infrastructure. I, you know, I was in Africa a little while ago and it's, you know, the, the cost of moving goods from 200 miles inside some countries out to the coastline is huge. It's, it's more expensive to do that than to ship from the port to Japan. Um, and in that world, near sourcing doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's one reason why countries, I think, really have to work to make sure that, you know, closer does mean cheaper. Okay, let, let me just add one thing on that. We have, uh, we have this mine in the DRC. We produce copper cathode, uh, a final copper product. And because of the lack of infrastructure, we have to truck that 3,000 kilometers to South Africa. We have 618 wheeler trucks going from Katanga through Zambia, Zimbabwe into South Africa every day. So, you know, near sourcing, we want to buy things in Indonesia when we can, but sometimes, like I said, you just got to adjust your business to what you have to deal with. Up the back. Uh, I was wondering, Miss um, uh, Indramati, uh, if First, if you could comment on some of the success that you had had in your anti-corruption fight when you were in Indonesia that you're given credit for, at least in your bio. Um, and particularly, what specific things were you able to do that were very effective and maybe some of the things that you tried that were not so effective and, uh, and what you see as the prospect going forward in, in, uh, in the economies that we're talking about? I will discuss that in the context of today's discussion. But I mean, when you talk about the effective and quality of institution, and corruption is definitely one of the aspects that affect the quality of institution. I, I give one example, cleaning up the customs, because that is going to be very important. When I was in Indonesia, of course, I know that Indonesia is an island country. It's a big island country. You can, they can easily smuggle here and there uh, uh, among uh, 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 this uh, island. 
if I have to deal with the whole thing, I think it's it's going to be impossible. I look at the staff of the customs uh, around 10,000 people of, uh, to safeguard Indonesia, and I see that the commodity in and out Indonesia, 65% is actually coming from Jakarta port. So if I can tackle in Jakarta, I can provide at least signal for the rest of Indonesia. I think this kind of conversation is very, very relevant because during spring meeting, annual meeting, when I met with uh, a lot of finance meetings, many of them is asking about uh, can bank provide them with the support on custom reform uh, in order for them to improve the revenue, but also in, in, in improving the governance in general. So yes, there is an experience there in Jakarta I said to the custom uh, chief, I want to replace all of them in Jakarta with the new staff. They have to go, went through the, the light detector, have the integrated test and all those things. And each of them, especially the decision maker, I will interview myself. And the interview is not asking whether you are going to corrupt or not corrupt. That's not relevant for you to ask. You ask like this, is there anything in your CV or your own career historical career in, in which I'm sure you've already receiving bribe in the past. So I, I don't assume anyone is actually clean there. But I will ask, if I'm going to put you in Tanjung Priok, that is in Jakarta, is there anyone, any business player, any politician can blackmail you now that you are going to be so scared to say no? Tell me who's that player and I will see whether I can handle that. So then from now on, you are going to be there and I expect you to do the job clean. So they feel that they are protected. I'm not asking what is their historical, but I said, give me one to name that you really scared that you will not be able to do your job because they are going to blackmail you by revealing that, oh, in the past you received. So with that kind of thing, you create a new culture of courage and a new commitment. Of course, it's not always uh, then smooth and linear. I have to invite Anti-Corruption Commission to look at them. It happened to be after one year, there is still small petty bribery. And you have to do all this, another shock therapy. I replaced one third of them. I said, one taking bribe, the whole group is going to be punished. So you have to do it again and again. I think it's, it's really, I mean, I have a lot of conversation with many of the Minister of Finance who are actually dealing with the real struggle of putting the good governance and, and anti-corruption. It's not a trivial matter. Uh, salary is one thing. So I said, okay, if salary is so low, I will provide you with the estimated cost of living plus so that you are not going to be perceived that you have become civil servants should be poor. You deserve a good standard of living. So we provide correct the salary scheme by adding, and then after that, you have to have this integrity. So a lot of things, which I think, I think in many developing countries, I'm not only referring to lack, um, uh, lack uh, experience, but yes, it is very, very relevant to many countries, and de especially developing countries, who struggle to develop the good governance and effective uh, institution. Thank you. We'll get that list of names later. Uh, from here. Uh, there. Uh, Diana Negroponte, the Brookings Institution. My question is for Secretary Blank. You head off to South America with a large delegation, but you will encounter competition from Chinese Development Bank investors, Chinese Petroleum Corporation investors. What are the advantages that you will offer to the host governments which the Chinese institutions cannot offer? So trade with China from Latin America has just soared, as I suspect everyone in this room knows. Um, China is, for instance, Brazil's largest trading partner, and it's replaced the U.S. in that role. Um, but there are some concerns about that trade, and I think one of the biggest concerns on the part of many Latin American countries is that China is particularly interested in them as sources of commodities. And, of course, their long-term development interest is not relying solely on their commodities, but developing manufacturing and services-based economies that are 
are more competitive on a larger global market. Um, and, you know, they don't want to be seen as simply commodities-based markets and, you know, want to develop more, more of their industry and their manufacturing and their advanced technologies. So, you know, one of the things that I think we bring in the United States is a real interest in helping them develop that. And, in fact, one of the, um, one of the talking points that I have used with my colleagues in Brazil, you know, when they say, well, you know, China has replaced the U.S., you know, we're obviously, you know, you know, nice to talk to you, but you know, you know, you know, you're not our major trading partner anymore. It's but ah, but if you look at your trade with China, that is majority commodities. If you look at your trade with the U.S., Brazil, the majority of Brazil's exports up to the United States actually are manufactured goods, so that they have a much higher level. Um, in a develop, you know, sort of a high level of development trade with the U.S. than they have with China, and that is something that they care about and should care about. So, you know, that that's that's one of it. You know, the other comment is, and this is just a. Um, you know, I, I know that some could argue with this, but I do think U.S. companies have a very good track record of really being good partners in the countries in which they go into and they invest. I mean, they do tend to go in. They want to stay for the long term. They invest in people. Um, they develop local talent. Um, they are not corrupt, um, and they are very well known for that. And, um, you know, and that makes them attractive partners as well. And, you know, not all other um, companies from other parts of the world have quite that same reputation. Okay, um, thank you. This question is also for uh, uh, Secretary Blank. Um, you uh, talked about uh, protectionism in uh, Latin America, particularly in Brazil. And um, I know that there, uh, the United States is paying Brazil more than $100 million a year so that um, uh, uh, preferences for U.S. cotton can be maintained. And I was wondering, if you could bring us up to date on the negotiations to resolve that issue. What about five minutes left? Yeah, yeah. yeah so um, there, there, you know, the, the issue here is that the U.S. does have certain cotton subsidies, which Brazil has challenged um, inside the WTO. And um, we have reached an agreement, but to implement that agreement requires some statutory changes in U.S. laws, and we're coming up to renewal, for instance, of, you know, our, some of our uh, major agricultural, um, uh, you know, statutes. Um, and um, in lieu of that statute not changing yet, we are therefore paying Brazil, you know, to not take further action while we essentially try to um, take the action we need to come into compliance. Um, you know, this is a political question as to whether, you know, it's a political question as to whether Congress is going to act to simply renew some of the things they need to renew. Um, but, you know, whether there's going to be a willingness to reduce some of the internal subsidies we have that, you know, have been found out of compliance with the WTO. And, um, you know, neither we nor Brazil want to get into a trade war over that, which is, you know, why we've been... Um, you know, quite willing to come to a, a temporary settlement uh, um, until we're at a point where we actually can change our statutes and um, different behavior will ensue, I hope. Thank you. My question is for Secretary Blank. Uh, I am Susanna Florian with the Parsons Corporation. If I may modestly suggest other talking points to your visit uh, about American engineering and constructions positive aspects, it has to do not only with quality, safety, innovation, but also as far as program management skill sets are concerned, the U.S. possesses the best in the world, I still think. And especially in Brazil, where deadlines for the FIFA and the Olympics are set, and their projects are far behind schedule and budget, I think it's in everybody's best interest to bring in American companies and catch up. Yeah, no, thank you. And, um, you know, it's one reason why we're really bringing um, primarily services-oriented companies with us to these countries, because I think you, the U.S. has an enormous advantage, not just with regard to Latin America, but around the world, in terms of some of our um, you know, the, the, just in general, our services, but particularly our infrastructure-related services, and whether it's logistics or whether it's security systems or any of that. I mean, the U.S. does lead the world in many, many companies, and um, you know, it's why I think we are potentially a very good partner to some of these Latin American countries and their infrastructure projects. Yes, and uh, let's ask them to use a lot of copper in these projects as well. So. <laughs> 
Thanks. Some of, thank you very much. We could have gone on for much longer, but we're getting the wind up. So I'd like to thank all our three panelists uh, uh, today uh, and the audience. Um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.